So has <coughs> uh, who's heard of Yapishev before you heard about this talk before? Okay, so and, and who's bought from us? Right, shame on the rest of you. Shame. <laughs> no, it shows that we've still got some work to do to reach the whole the whole uh, country. We are yeah, we're as JD said, we're Yapishev, we sell kitchen tools and food and wine and recently digital products, so online cooking courses and things and in South Africa, but we have we now ship to about eight other countries um, in Africa and the UAE, and obviously our digital products we can ship to the world, which is which is great. Uh, I'm going to tell you the story of how we started and try to go back to the early days and how we got to where we are now. It's quite a it'll be fairly short, and I've got half an hour. So at the end, hopefully, if there's um, some parts of the story that you want to go back to or or things that you'd be interested in. Uh, I'd be happy to, to answer those questions. So my background uh, was in web development and designing and building business systems for people. And so I would, I would, I, I was in Cape Town originally from Natal, but when I moved out to Cape Town, set up a company here, and we'd go out and we would have to sell an hour of our time and, uh, and, and then make the money. And then when you've done that, you do it again and again and again. And you're basically working for the worst boss in the world because he never gives you leave that's paid for and when he's sick he doesn't care and, and working for yourself in that context is pretty miserable and everyone who does this uh, kind of work for yourself selling your time dreams about this guy who's sitting on the beach with a very odd laptop um, no. uh, and he's, he's, he's sort of sitting back and, and somehow he's making money while he doesn't actually do the work in the moment so he's selling something other than his time and so everyone who's in the kind of web industry building something for people, selling their time, thinks, well, why can't we do this for, for ourselves? Why can't we build something that we can just wake up on a Monday morning and go, oh, look, someone put money in our account over the weekend. And so it's shifting from selling time to selling a product, which is a, a dream that most of us want in some form or the other. And so we decided, well, instead of just talking about this, we're going we're gonna to actually do it. So there were four of us. Uh, Shane, who's still a partner in Yappy Ship, and two other guys, Fred and John, and we got together for a, a kind of three-day event. It was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and the four of us each brought a, Shane's taking the one taking the photo, which is why he's there, and each of us bought a product. This is in 2005, and we each bought a product that we thought we were going to be able to sell online, and on the first, the start of the Thursday, uh, we voted for what the best product was going to be, and uh, there were various ideas, and the idea that won was uh, the bug zapper. If you, know, if you know the bug zapper, it's like a, a racket for swatting flies and mosquitoes. And so in this three-day event, we went about setting up a, an e-commerce store. And we found a, a courier company that could deliver, and we set up um, payment facilities and, and built the website. The website didn't look exactly like that, but it was a similar kind of one-page, one-product thing. And we, we launched it on the Saturday. And we sold one to my mom. Uh, <laughs> we had, we'd forgotten about the marketing part. Uh, but between then, between 2005, and it finally kind of closed down last year, we sold about 10,000 bug zappers, which is about one and a half million rands worth of uh, electric rackets on the internet. Which sounds like a lot, but when you divided it over the eight years it was running, it wasn't exactly going to um, blow the lights out. But it did prove that what we were aiming for was possible, that in, you, could, you could have a product that you sold online and people would be willing to give you money. And for, for most of Bug Zapper's life, it was run by Shane's dad, who lived in a, he was a retired guy, and lived in a flat in Kenilworth, and he logged in the morning and saw someone who bought a Bug Zapper, and he put it in a box, and he, he shipped it off. And so it was exactly what we, what we had intended. And, and so when we launched this, we, th we thought, well, let's do it for, uh, for all sorts of other things. And, and this, um, only an exclusively small group of people, and whoever's watching on the video, get to see uh, this site, which was called uh, Rat Zapper. Uh, which, is, um, which was the second one that we launched. And the rat zapper was similar to the bug zapper in that it killed pests. Um, and, uh, and very humanely, actually, because it, uh, you know, it's not poison or squishing and things like that. So we, we sold the rat zapper online. And we also launched a site selling country flags and poles. So we, we sort of felt like we had the mechanism. We had the ability to deliver and to, and to take payment and to transact online and so we could just roll out selling things uh, whatever we wanted to sell and, and you kind of it might sound like strange things but you think of a country flag or a rat zapper or a bug zapper if I said to you you need to go and buy a Swedish flag where would you go? Well, I, don't, I don't know I mean you probably google it you know, 
flag from Sweden. Or you've seen one of these bug zapper things and around, someone else had it at a bra and you think, well, I don't know where to go. Or you've got a rat problem in your house and you think, well, where do you go to like solve rat problems? And so in 2005, 2006, the internet was not mainstream. You didn't go online to buy anything. There's no, I mean, no way is anyone was selling something like clothes online. The online retail was for, other than books and DVDs and games, online retail really was, it fell into the categories of things that you couldn't find in a, in a physical store. Because if you could find them in a physical store, you would go there. Uh, expectations were pretty low. If, if you, you know, customers were happy to wait 10 days to have the thing delivered because there weren't, there wasn't really a rush. It was something they couldn't find in any other space. So we were going through the, the products and the, the next one that we, we thought of was, was kitchen tools. And Shane uh, had, he had studied as a, not study, but he had thought about studying as a, as a chef, but in the 90s, chefing was kind of for druggies and dropouts. It wasn't really the, mm -hmm. the career that it is today. It wasn't as sexy as it is today. Uh, but he had always been a bit of a kind of foodie at heart. And so we went to a chef friend of ours and said, well, what are the 12 kitchen tools that you, you, you know, you couldn't live without? Because we, you know, we've been selling an individual product like a bug zapper. We didn't, we thought, well, let's have a small range that we can just kind of <coughs> keep and we can sell these things. And, and the chef friend that we found said, well, I don't know if they are, 12 tools, but there's this one. There's these set of tongs that you can't get in a physical store. I got them from overseas, and these are really amazing tongs, and like you should really sell these. And the brand of these tongs was called QC Pro, and we happened to know the people who imported QC Pro into the country. And we realized that the brands that people wanted, um, or that some people wanted, weren't available necessarily in all the stores, because Borden's and at home, which are really the main stores, they can't stock everything. And so, well, there we go. This is kind of following the same pattern that we had before of online being good for products that you can't get in physical stores. So let's sell branded kitchen tools uh, that are harder to come by and that people will actually go online to search for and, and have them delivered. So this was the, the very first design of, uh, of the site. Um, and it, it was, you know, from the beginning, we had this sort of cooking good thing and we're trying to pitch a bit of lifestyle. Um, this, this site itself didn't go live. This was sort of the first concept that we ever had. See the top cooking tools, tips, and gizmos. Goodness me, we don't sell any gizmos, but that was what we uh, what we were pitching there. And so Yappy Chef was launched in, um, well, it was built on in 2006. This is the great thing about Google <coughs> Chat is that it archives your chats forever. So this was one of the early chats that Shane and I had. It was about half past eight at night, and Shane saying, "Hey, Giza," I said, "Hey," and I said, "What are your latest Yappy Chef emotions?" And Shane said, "What do you mean?" I said, are you amped down on mutual? Shane said, 50% amped, holding out to see this thing happen. I said, it varies. And then the great line, it seems so much harder than Bug Zapper. Um, and we kind of talk about this. And what you can see from this, this is in May 2006, is that Yappy Chef was not launched with a whole lot of venture capital, uh, where we gave up our jobs and we hired 50 people and we jumped into this thing and we made it happen. This was like two guys working during the day, still selling our time to clients. Um, and dabbling a bit with e-commerce, and in the evenings, kind of hacking away at this thing that seems really hard. And, and I think that's one of the kind of main lessons that, um, that I've served other people, is that businesses that end up being really successful, uh, well, and ours, I'm not necessarily saying we're really successful, businesses that you read about that have now made it, didn't necessarily all start where on day one it was amazing. If you read uh, Jeff Bezos in the Everything Store, which is kind of a, a book about Amazon and its history. You know, they sold eleven thousand dollars of books in their first week, and there's someone who's like launches and like bam, it happens. And that's 1995. That just blows my mind. A lot of other companies start, and it's it's sort of months before they even launch, and then when they do launch, it's it's not necessarily a sure thing, even at that stage. We um we launched in 2000. In, that was in May. We actually ended up launching in August, and so that's how long it took. And we made our first sale on the 16th of August. It's today the 16th of August. It is exactly eight years today since we made our... Oh, it's the 15th today. Okay, so tomorrow is exactly eight years since we made our first sale. So these are the first eight sales that you can see Shane's dad, Bevan Dryden, on the 16th of August. Denise Gunner, on the 20th of November, was the first person we didn't know. Uh, the rest are all family and friends. So it took us until November to sell to someone who we didn't know. And, and we, sold to, we, sold, we sold to him. We thought, gee, this person has, like given, paid money into our bank account and hoped that we're going to send them some kitchen tools. She doesn't even know who we are. Like, that is incredible. Uh, let's, like, prove that we're human and thank her for doing that. So we hand wrote a letter and we said, hey, Denise, thank you so much for shopping from us. And we put it in the box and, and we shipped the thing off. And since then, we have put a handwritten card in every order that's ever left 
deputyship. So we hire full-time card writers now, and, um, <laughs> and, and extras, and everyone else in the business also helps out, and we handwrite a card. And it's an important part of us like proving that we're human, proving that the other side of the internet, they are human beings, and that e-commerce is not uh, a mechanical arm that picks a product off a shelf and drops it in a box and ships it out. Because if something goes wrong, then you can't come and break the mechanical arms and kneecaps, you know. So people want to know that they're buying from people, and so that's always been an important thing for us. You'll notice there that there's nothing in December because we made no sales in December 2006. It took us, 200, uh, it took us a year to make the first 200 sales, um, and those names of the first 200 people are in a wall in our office, uh, sort of celebration of, of the, I guess, their trust in us and our perseverance to keep going despite how many sales. That's my lounge. Well, it's still my lounge, but that's where we launched from. And this was uh, a real sort of lounge, garage, startup situation. We launched in 2006, and this is 2008, January 2008, and Mike, who was our first employee, and he says, is it fine to use the tape now? So he's talking about those like tape gun things that, <laughs> that you pack the boxes with. And he's asking me at Hoppers 2 in the afternoon, can you use it now? And I said, yes, that's fine. You need to, if we're going to make the career three, you've got to pack the boxes. And this is because my second son, who at that stage was about three months old, slept his afternoon sleep was just opposite where Mike packed the boxes. And if Mike made too much noise, then it would wake up Jake. So this was a home industry. <laughs> this, was a, this was like two guys in a lounge uh, hacking away. This is Shane packing a box. We packed all the boxes, well, until Mike came here. But Shane packing a box, and he's trying to cut it down. You know, it's a bigger box, and he's sort of cutting it down to try and save space. You can see the bug zappers over there as well. So we were selling bug zappers and flags and, um, and, and yuppie shit stuff. Uh, and we, we took a lot of pride in the boxes. This was in the very early days, there's the letter, it's now a card, but that's a letter inside of a silver envelope. And, and, you know, this was our physical representation of who we are. This is the only thing that someone's going to experience of us. And so we want it to be like opening a gift, like, you know, from your grandmother, brown paper packages tied up with string, that type of thing. And so we, we, we took great part in this. We walked, I live in Plumstead, we walked to the end of the road to the stationery store, and we bought that wrapping paper. We would buy out all the pink wrapping paper that they had. <laughs> uh, and we'd buy a roll of tape from the stationery store there. And we'd walk back down the road and, and pack the boxes. Um, and, and buy some bubble wrap and things like that. And in 2008, by hopping through the year, we moved to some offices. There's Mike, the first employee, and Sarah, who was the first person in customer service. And myself, and then Shane, who was the other co-founder, and Paul, who we, we roped in at that stage as well to be one of the partners. We only had four boxes on that day, which is why Mike has to all the fire extinguishers. <laughs> we didn't have fire boxes. We moved into these these offices. They were they were just normal offices because we were still we still had clients and we were still doing the other client work. Um, but we wanted somewhere to uh, to be that was not our lounge. And this was our warehouse at the time. Uh, that's the shelf where we kept all our stock. And we actually didn't hold any stock in the beginning. We just we got in effectively as we were going to go out, except for these these knives, these global knives, the G2s. We sold a lot of those, so we had four. That was pretty much our stock holding in the early days. Otherwise, as we made a sale, we would order from the supplier, who most of them were in Cape Town, and we'd get it in, and then we'd ship it out. And it was fine to do that, because in those days, the expectations were pretty low from customers. You know, if it arrived in a week, that was great. These days, we have a lot of stock, uh, because people want to, you know, if they get it tomorrow, it's like, gee, only tomorrow. Uh, expectations have raised a bit over the years. We uh, hand wrote every Wable. Uh, until the courier couldn't read Mike's handwriting, and so they said, please, you've got to make a plan. We're going to know where to deliver these things. And so we slowly started um, introducing new systems, like printing out the waybills and eventually producing stickers that automatically get printed out. And so we scaled up as we needed it. You know, in the beginning, uh, we would just get the stock in, put it in a box, and send it out. And then I remember Shane went away, and I was in charge. And in the one week, there were like three orders at the same time. And so I had to, like... I printed out a piece of paper for each order and I put it on the table and then as the stock came in for that particular order I put it on top of the piece of paper until I could see, okay, everything is out here and then you put it in the box and ship it out. And we've got to make a better system for this. So slowly started building the systems to uh, you know, know what order to stock to order and then know when an order is ready to now be shipped. And there weren't that many, there's a lot <coughs> better e-commerce systems now, uh, but in those days it was, there wasn't really that much certainly not free uh, or open source. So we built things from scratch, and, and that had been our history, so that we were advantaged in that. And then we built interesting things um, that suit our way of doing business, like the handwritten cards in each order. So because we built it ourselves, we've been able to um, customize it as we go along. I, I'm always interested by this photograph, because I, obviously we took it, because we were so amazed at the number of orders that we did in one day. I can't think of why else we would take a photo of, of six boxes. 
Um, but we obviously chuffed with the volume that we were getting. And uh, then we, we started having more boxes uh, until we couldn't actually, this was our kitchen and you couldn't really get to the kitchen because there were too many boxes in, in, our, in our space. And I think, I think the peak that we ever got in that little office was 201 day. And, and that was pretty hectic because it wasn't really a warehouse, it was just an office. And we had to store the boxes um, in the kind of office next door because they had moved out and it became a little bit chaotic. So we knew we had to move to some other office space. So in 2011, we moved into, it was actually just 100 meters down the road, but we moved into a different space. Um, we moved into this unit here, which kind of had some offices and some warehouse. And slowly now we've taken over both of them on each side and two at the back. And so we've now got five units that we sort of bash the walls between and, and we move around it. So we are now, uh, this is actually last year, a year ago's birthday party, but it's quite a nice party. We're about 80 people now. Uh, and we're all in one space. So customer service and warehouse and marketing and design and development and, and everything all in one place. And we have uh, some fairly... Um, you know, fairly big sort of receiving areas and storage and things. It's, you can't photograph it all in one shot because it's, it's so spread out. And there is uh, Isaac, the famous Tetris player who manages to squeeze stuff into the, <laughs> into the boxes. So, yeah, so 2011 when we moved into this current space, we were seven people. And so really the last three years has been, um, has been our, our growth from 7 to 80. And that's, it's been um, also because e-commerce in general has grown. You know, the last, really the last two years, there's been a, so much investment in South African e-commerce and with, with physical stores like Woolworths and Mr. Price really putting a lot of money into their stores which gives people confidence and then obviously the funded stores like Take Lot and Kalahari and Groupon and Superbulous, they, they're, they're doing great things and as everyone has a better experience shopping in line, people shop in line and I think that they sort of finally South Africans are realizing, still on a very small scale, but they're sort of starting to trust the process and that benefits all of us. And that brings us to today. Um, not necessarily done, but uh, I'm done with the talk part of the talk, and we can now kind of take whatever action, whatever um, direction we want to take with uh, questions about how we do things, or our story, or uh, anything else that you may have in mind. Uh, last year, we, we did a, a cooking course uh, with Sarah Graham, who's one of the local sort of chef people, and we did this this baking course called The Art of Baking, and we it had six modules, um, so six 10-minute videos with like uh, course notes and a quiz, a quiz and a forum that you could discuss it on, and we launched this as a, as a free thing just to get people, I guess, to know about us, and we had people from 90 countries sign up to do the course, um, about, I think, 14,000 people signed up to do the course, and we thought, wow, this is pretty cool, and we did it fairly easily, so well, what if we do this and we have some free but then some paid courses. So this year we launched paid courses with um, people like Peter Goffwood and Carmen, who's the MasterChef winner, and these people delivering uh, courses in a similar format, so videos and, and notes and quizzes and forums, uh, and teaching people how to cook with various things. And so that, that's our first digital product where you actually pay us money and, and we ship you something um, digital as opposed to physical, which is, which is great because obviously uh, we can sell it to the whole world without actually shipping something to the, to the whole world. And we've got unlimited stock and, we've, and there's all sorts of benefits of a digital product. It does mean, of course, that we're competing with the whole world. So people who want to learn something online can get it from anywhere. And so that, that's been a bit of a lesson for us where we have, you know, when we existed here, we were the only ones selling, I don't know, Wistoff knives online. Whereas now there's lots of people who do digital products. So digital has got some great advantages and it's also got some some competitive things. So that's the first digital product we're doing, but we will we'll continue to explore other, other options of basically um, you know, monetizing the foodie space without necessarily having to put a product in a box, and there's quite a lot of ideas that we'll, we'll take down that road. Well, I mean, one way to look at it is, is it was in 2011, so we launched in 2006. It was 2011 until Shane and Paul and myself got a salary, our full salary paid from Yappy Chef. So it took five years before uh, we were, we were, I guess, personally breaking even from Yappy yeah. Chef, uh, even if the company is in a different situation. And I think that that is one of the, uh, that, that I think is, is encouraging for people who are starting out and they go, oh, thank goodness, you know, I'm in month two, at least, uh, at least I'm not doing badly. It can also be discouraging, like, cracky, five years. Like, I can't survive for five years. 
And and I suppose so. You got to take it. You got to you got to take the positive from that. E-commerce in two thousand and six was a difficult place to be in. It was kind of the um, it was difficult to make money off. And and so what the picture I like to say is like imagine you plant a spinach plant, and as a little bit of green comes out of the ground, you like so hungry that you snip it off and eat it. And then a little bit of green comes out and you snip it off and you eat it. If you're trying to eat this plant before you've actually let it grow, um, you're going to damage it. So because we could survive um, still doing effectively consulting work, it allows us to spend the money hiring other people and spend it on marketing and, and things like that. So uh, we, we chose to make that a very slow process. But I think however long you think your company is going to take to break even, you probably are not giving it long enough. It just always takes longer and there's always expenses. And the longer that you can give it, um, without having to sort of crush it with your own needs, your own personal needs, the better. Um, there's some people who obviously strike it lucky, but on the whole, uh, the longer the better. So I kind of try and get people to think about what other income can we get in the meantime um, that can continue so that we don't put as much pressure. Because sometimes, you know, if we had had to stop up to three years because it wasn't giving us a salary, then we wouldn't have got to where we were today. So the longer the better. But I guess answer your question at some point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I suppose what kept the sharks faith for what 50 years before we were the carry <laughs> Um I guess there's a couple of things. You know, we were we didn't want to sell our time by the hour, and and so we were motivated by like we have to sell a product. We we just it's just uh, yeah. I think that we there was a sense of like to build something that we own, that we that we can build this brand. And every day, because when you sell your own time in a consulting capacity, you basically are your own brand. And so if you, you build this thing up, it's never going to be anything without you. And I think we really were motivated by building something that existed without us. And you could stand back and people go, we love yuppie shit. Not we love Andrew and Shane, but we love this thing that we built. And that was a massively motivating thing for us. And it kept us going in that time. Um, I guess it also kept us going because we weren't reliant on it. You know, it's not like we were starving in that time. We were, we were able to keep going without having to crush it. So obviously we were... Everyone always wants whatever they're doing to grow. And we were growing. I mean, we were more than doubling every year all that time. So you kind of like feel like, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. It is coming. Even if it's not paying us today, we can see that it's going to come at some point. As opposed to uh, if we had, um, if, if it wasn't really growing as fast, and you think, well, I don't know. We're going to have to have this miracle in order to get there. It was like we knew it was going to come. It was just, just around the corner. And that probably kept us going in the short term. Yeah, so we do, we do actually have an investor. We don't talk about it a huge amount. We're not, um, some people use getting investment as like a big PR moment where they can like tell the world. We, we don't, so um, that's our issue and it's kind of something we keep a bit private. So yeah, we did take some money because there are things that we wanted to do, uh, particularly I guess when we start holding more stock and things like that, there are, there are capital expenses that, that if we don't, it's actually really gonna hurt us because if we don't have enough stock for Christmas, we can't make the sales then, and you can't arrive in December, and then you know the suppliers have closed down, or they don't for the Christmas period. Then you've got to kind of buy that in October, and in October we don't have the money. So there's certain things that we wanted to do, particularly around stock um, and staff and marketing. Those are always the expenses that you think these are these are effectively an investment in the future. And and yeah, you do give up something for that, but you've got to decide whether you want a uh, smaller piece of a bigger pie big piece of a smaller part. But I think the longer that that can wait, the better, because obviously the, lo the later you give up any equity, the, the smaller it needs to be for the money that you want. On day one, you might be able to get an investor to get excited about your idea, but you're going to have to give up a lot of it. Whereas when you've got a track record, you can give a much smaller amount for, a, for, for more cash to do what you want to do. So, yeah. Well, <laughs> there's lots of ways to answer that. I think the biggest thing for us is I, I look back on the on the, what we called that, that three-day event when we launched Bugs Up, we called it the Extreme Business Event. And think, if we hadn't done that, we would never have got there. We'd never got there. I mean, obviously, along the road, there's a whole lot of other things that would have caused us to um, you know, make it or not make it. But like, the most important thing was that we started. Because um, like, if you don't even step out the door, you've got a 100% chance of failing. At least stepping out the door, there's a chance you're going to succeed. But uh, there is, I guarantee you will fail if you never start. You, don't you have that coming down the road, as you come down the stairs into this area, you've got something about like, uh, something along those lines. I forget what the quote is right now. So I think that that's the, the fundamental thing. I look at that, back at that event, and I just think, how many people stand around the bra saying, oh, we should really do this. You know, like I've got this awesome idea, we should really do this. 
just freaking well do it. Like, just start. And just launch. I mean, that's the other thing, is that, like, it wasn't perfect when we launched, but heck, only like three people saw it, so who cares? Um, you know, I think we kind of wait, some, too many people wait too long before they launch something. And, and they kind of lose faith almost before they even got out the door, and they spend too much money. And let, let sales drive your spend on money. I mean, I don't know what type of businesses you guys are involved in here, but like, start something, and then wherever the sales are happening, let that sales sort of drive where you spend your time. To kind of, like, take a, people take a year, because they're perfecting every detail, and, and it's too long, by then it's, it's too late. Like, even though it took us a good couple of months, the reality was, like, the most important thing was, like, getting it out the door. Well, bugs at the first, I guess, and then you have to shit second. So that's, that's a big lesson. Now, here's lots of other lessons, but you'll have to be a bit more specific about the type of lessons you want um, along the way. So what type of businesses are you involved in? Uh, anyone? Or looking at starting or something? Looking at starting. Yeah, what are you looking at starting? Um, well, Jade and I want to start something. Yeah. And we are just interested in, in design and just okay. cool products and cool ideas. Yeah. And um, so we're going to try it out on some crowdfunding website. Okay. So we're kind of getting it together and now we just have to step it up the door. Okay. Yeah. So you or anyone else, like, what's your what's the biggest sort of obstacle in your own path? Do you wish you could get out the way, clear out the way? I had some whispers, but I didn't hear any actual statements. No one got any issues. You guys all just cruising down the line. You don't know exactly where to start and what to focus on. Yeah. Like, it's kind of difficult to figure out is this more important or is this more yeah. important? Because I can do this and let that happen, but if I do this, that can happen. And so you have time management. Okay. Yeah. And, and how many people are full-time in your businesses where you kind of, no, no one's full-time, everyone's doing something else. Because that's another challenge, is like you know, finding the time to, to, to do it. So, um, Seth Godin, I don't know how much you know him, he's a, uh, I guess a blogger, writer, speaker thing. And he's got a great podcast series. So it's free on, I guess, iTunes podcasts. Um, and it's, it's something to do with entrepreneurism or something like that. It's like in the top 10 business podcasts on iTunes. And here's, it's about 15 episodes of about 20 minutes each, and he covers, I guess, things like that, like how do you know what to start, and how do you get your first customers, and, and it's, it's really good. So Seth, S-E-T-H, Godin, G-O-D-I-N, great podcast series. Um, and, and he speaks about a couple of things which I really think, gee, if I'd known that at the beginning. One of the things he speaks about is network effects. So how, does, how do you create something where the more people are using it, the more people will want to use it? So if you think of the fax machine, the fax machine, the first person had the fax machine, it was useless to them. They needed like other people to have a fax machine. So they were incentivized to tell everyone about the fax machine. And I kind of think about the lesson like that, which is, you know, Facebook and LinkedIn and those things are more powerful the more people use it. How can you build that into your company from day one, mm -hmm. where the more people who are going to use this, the more powerful it's going to become. And so there's lessons like that that he talks about, I think, that are, that are great sort of foundational um, lessons to starting a company. Because, yeah, I think that they are, everyone is going through very similar um, challenges and, and the more you can sort of learn from other people, the better. We, we do have our own tools and we're going to focus on that because um, at the moment we've got a limited range but by the end of the year we're going to have a much bigger range of, of our products. We won't ever have physical stores. Um, we were very close, we actually almost, we, we put an offer to lease a place to, to launch our first physical store and uh, the lease fell through and I'm grateful every day since because that is a whole other level of pain and suffering and cash to launch physical stores. But um, I think that, that fundamentally we, on a, on a, we want to be a global company. That, that's what we want to do. That South Africa is fantastic, but it is tiny, 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 tiny. And I was looking at, um, I was reading a recent book. So there's about six million taxpayers in South Africa. Um, well, now there's more, but now everyone has to be. But there's six million who kind of crossed the threshold until recently. And of that, I think only 10%, so only 600,000 earn more than 400,000 rand a year. So that's like 35 rand a month. So unless you're selling something to a mass market on a cheap scale, you've got kind of like 600,000 people who can and buy from you. And that is tiny. That is like, yeah. I mean, that's like how many people live in Manhattan. So when you think of a world scale and how many people there are out there, uh, we would like to be global. And as I said earlier, that's great because they're just, you know, there's so many customers, but there's also so many competitors. So we've got to try to work out how, like, what have we got that's actually world class. And, and you know, interesting thing, when you, when you start competing on a global scale, if I ran a dry cleaner in Plumstead, 
I only have to be better than all the dry cleaners in Plumstead uh, because nobody's going nobody's to take their dry cleaning to Manhattan because that's the best dry cleaning store in the world. Whereas you think of like Google, Google has to, if I launch a search engine, I'd have to be better than Google because they can take the entire market for searches in the world. <coughs> so you think about like, what a, am I going to aim for a niche where I can probably be the best, either geographically or just because Google doesn't care about cooking courses? Um, you know, themselves. I'm not going to, I only have to be better than all the other people producing cooking courses. The bigger your vision, the bigger that you aim to buy talk, like I'm going to be the next social network, I'm going to take on Facebook. You know, the bigger the potential rewards, but also the harder the competition is to master. So that's what we're going to look at now when we're going forwards, is, is we want to be a global company, but at what? What are we going to compete at that we can actually be the best in the world? So, so we think we've got something with our cooking courses. Uh, we'll have to see what other things can actually compete on a global scale. So with physical goods, we've got to aim for countries that they aren't competitors. It's very difficult for us to sell a frying pan to someone in America or the UK, uh, but to Namibia or Botswana or Mauritius or UAE, it's, it's a bit easier. So physical products, we've obviously got, um, it's, it's harder geographically. Digital products, we can sell to the whole world, um, but we have to have something special to do that. <laughs> um, so part of our, our marketing strategy, you know, remembering also when we started, e-commerce was kind of nowhere, and so we had to build credibility. And we used as much um, offline media as we could, because it is, you can target people who are searching for, like, buy a knife online, you know, so you can do things like Google advertising and things like that. But if nobody's Googling buy a knife online, then you're not going to get any traffic. So we had to kind of move people from an offline space to an online space to even start thinking about that. So I don't know what you're selling, but part of the thing is like, are people online, are, are, can you even reach them online? We'd have to start with some of the offline. So we tried to use a lot of magazines and things to get um, our products in there, you know, like in the Open the Fair Lady magazine, which <coughs> a lot of you do. And there'll be like, pictures of products that says available at Yuppie Chef. Now, that type of thing you don't pay for, you've just got to provide uh, to the magazine. So we try to use offline media to actually get people online. And then from an online space, um, we try to just give away vouchers. So we were, we were convinced that if someone experienced us, they would want to experience us again. Until they actually got that box delivered to them, uh, they, would, they don't actually know how good we are. So if we can give away vouchers at events or in magazines or something like that, we're acquiring a customer who hopefully is going to become a lifetime customer. So. So I guess offline and online we give away vouchers. We give away physical vouchers and we give away digital vouchers and try and get people to, to experience us and go through the, the process. Now that might work or might not work for what you're selling, but it's still a principle, which is you've got to trust that your, your process is good enough that if you can get someone to try it once, they will, they will want to do it again. I guess that's the idea. Yeah. There's a couple of principles. I guess the one is, uh, is as a founder, to really care about what you're doing in the business itself, to be amongst the team working for you is a key thing. That uh, that people will people watch what you do and know what you say. So I guess if your question is what do you have to say or what do you have to to sort of lay out what structures, I think the fundamental thing is to be there and to be really caring. And the people around are going to pick that up automatically. So so I think we didn't necessarily have to do a whole lot deliberately right in the beginning. We just had to be there and be and be passionate about what we're doing. And then that that built around us. But as we've grown, and now there's obviously a lot of people who don't see me that much, and so we have to put some more more clear things in place. Like, we have to be really clear about what our purpose is. Why are we doing this? And we have to try and communicate that as much as possible. Why are we doing what we're doing? Why is it, why is it important? Why do we sell kitchen tools and not something else? And so that, that, is, that is our purpose, and then our values are, well, how are we going to go about selling these, uh, selling these, well, achieving this purpose? So having a clear sort of values and vision statement is means that you can sort of get people onto the same path as you. So, yeah, I think in the in the early stages, it's not necessarily that important because if you're sitting next to the person, they're going to pick up your values and your your vision. But as you grow, you have to start being a bit more deliberate about why we exist and and, and who we are as a group of people. So, I mean, obviously we have we've got multiple payment methods. So, um, EFT bank transfers is pretty simple, and we also take e-bucks and discovery miles. Um, credit cards is the bulk of it, and we have multiple payment gateways and multiple merchant facilities because, because of failover and, and things like that. But basically your, your options are, um, if you're going to get your own merchant facility, so you're going to go to the bank and say, I want to be able to take credit cards, you've got to prove, I guess, some sort of threshold and reliability things, so you can't always get that up front. But once you can do that, um, you go through a payment gateway, so Paygate, um, 
Margate, BCS, and Payu. You know, Payfast is not exactly a payment gateway. Well, well Payfast kind of are, but Payfast, you leave your site and you go onto Payfast and they deal with the payment and then they send you back the customer. To take credit card payments where you stay on your site, your options are, or well, I think if you add Ivory, Ivory, Payu, um, Paygate, Mygate, and BCS. So your five payment gateways. And they then, you talk to them and they talk to your bank. So uh, those, those are your options. You, Payfast is probably the easiest because you don't then need your own merchant facility. I don't know if there's more than Payfast, just those options. But yeah, those, those are your options. It's a little bit tricky. We have, it's slightly clunky in South Africa and not, not wonderful there. I look at some of the international options for payment and the guards. Brilliant. But you've kind of got to, to do the best that you can. I think that fundamentally, like, <coughs> the right customer will find a way of paying you. Um, you know, so you can launch with just, here's our bank details, transfer money into our bank account. And if you can't get customers who are willing to do that, then you don't really have a business. Then obviously over time, you want to make it easier and easier, and you want to sort of capture those people who bailed at the last minute because you didn't have credit card facilities. But I think this goes back to one of my first things of just launch. Don't let payment, something like payment, and there's lots of examples like that, hold you up. Because if you've got a product worth buying, then people will make a plan to do things like get you the money. Um, if you don't, if you have to almost like have everything lined up so perfectly, otherwise they're going to fail, then that probably shows that you don't have something that's worth, worth buying. So I think it, was, it wasn't necessarily like a strategic decision to make. It was more who we were. So Shane and Paul both come from a design background. And so you know, Shane designed the, the original logo. and. And even though we look at some of the old stuff now and it looks a little bit sort of clunky, it was at the time, I guess, fairly leading. And so it's just been who we are. We've, uh, you know, the great thing about, about an online business is that you, even if you're working out of your lounge, if you create a, a really professional image, that's what people think that you are. They think you're as big as you, as you look online. And so it is, it is worth um, spending the time on that. But yet at the same time, I go back to what I've just said previously, if, if you feel like my product's not going to sell, or my service's not going to sell, and this I you know, get everything perfectly slick, then you probably don't have a, a desire enough product or service. So you've got to kind of play them both up, as I think that it has always been important for us. Our interface and the way that, that we look and we come across is massively important. But at the same time, people wanted to buy Kizu Pro Tongs, and they didn't actually care what it looked like or the fact that we couldn't have credit card facilities. They wanted those tongs, and they couldn't buy them. So it's sort of you've got to weigh, weigh them both up. Um, we've got a... We do just about everything in-house, and so we've got full-time designers and, and, and people who, who focus on this and are passionate about it. Um, yeah, so one of our advantages is that the most expensive parts of an e-commerce site, which would really be the design and the development, we could do ourselves, and that was a big, big advantage. If people have to pay from that from the beginning, it can be very expensive, but um, yeah, so I guess we were fortunate in that sense. Yeah, so I mean, at the time, um, we launched in August 2006, and my first son was uh, six months old, seven months old when we launched, and my second son was born then in 2008, so I, I, I that's not desirable, I mean, you, the first plan is like be single and be able to work like 20 hours a day, that's, that's ideal, but I guess it is possible um, to balance other things, and I don't know, it's... I guess this is my hobby in a way, and so I, I work and I spend time with my family, and a lot of my friends are at work, so that's sort of a bit of an advantage. Uh, it is difficult, you're going to have to, people have to prioritize, and they have to, to lose things. I think you can't, you can't have it all. Um, you can't have, you can't give full time to everything, you have to decide what's going what's gonna to drop. If this is now something you've got to add into your life, starting a business, and you, you've got to think, well, what do I have to drop out of that? So I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Um, I guess I've got an understanding why <laughs> kids who don't know any different. So maybe that's an advantage. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's, it's, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Um, so I suppose this is what I choose to do. On a Saturday night, like I'll sneak out my laptop. And just, yeah, <laughs> this is what, I, what I'm passionate about. So, yeah. Good. Any other questions? All right, then that's it. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, we've got Some, some vino. Thank you very much. Cool. Yeah, thanks for me. Cool. And thank you guys for coming. It was a lot of fun. Thank you again, Andrew. Um, and then we see you guys next week again. <laughs>